Good morning. So glad that you all are here. Thanks for joining us in person. And also, thanks for joining us online. And we've got a number of people who watch us online every week. And uh, so just so thankful for uh, everyone to be able to join us. We are in week three of our seven-week elephant series. Are we having fun yet? <laughs> Laughter and like a yeah and a couple claps. And then the rest of you are like, what? This is fun? Yes, this is fun. We are spending seven weeks uh, talking about difficult topics, and you gave me many difficult topics and difficult questions, and we are not able to cover all of them. Uh, I'm going to try to address them as the year goes on and into the next year a bit, uh, but we picked a, a handful of them uh, that are, we just feel we need to talk about right now and, and even uh, feel God moving a couple things around a little bit in the coming weeks here. Uh, but we are looking at some elephants in the room. What are some things that we're talking about or not talking about? Uh, how are we basing this on Scripture? And really the heartbeat behind this entire series is that we want to have, as Paul said, the mind of Christ. We want to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. And really to have the posture of Jesus. Because we can engage in conversations with each other and people around us and not be very Jesus-y at all. And that's really been the shortcoming of the church for many, 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 many years. And uh, my prayer is that we as a church can be, uh, have this posture of Jesus and to look like Jesus. Now, as I said the first couple of weeks, uh, I'm gonna do my best to present scripture because we wanna root what we're saying in scripture. We wanna process through scripture. And I'm gonna do my best to present that. I also said you're gonna be offended or convicted, however you wanna look at it, and I ask you to do the, the homework of why. Why did that hit me the way it did? Why is that unsettling? Why is that there? And really go back and, and say, what are my assumptions going into said topic? Is it from scripture? Is it from culture? Is it from something I was taught, something I experienced? What is it that makes me have that reaction? And even if you're sitting here just going like, oh, that's good, that's good, that's good, keep coming, keep coming. Why are you doing that? Like, don't just mind-numbingly take things in, like challenge thought, ask questions of everything that's being done. And then to really encourage conversation to go on beyond what's just happening here, is take that into your groups, into your communities. And this week, this Tuesday night, I'm gonna be at the Union at 6.15 to about 7.15 or so, and we're gonna talk about last week's topic of money slash generosity and then this week's topic as well. And so if you wanna continue this conversation in a space uh, that is led with compassion and conviction and continuation, I invite you to be a part of that, again, at the Union downtown at 6.30 on Tuesday. Uh, with that, we'd love to have you. Now, I just mentioned a moment ago that last week we talked about money, and ultimately about generosity, about stewardship. And at the end of the message, I asked you to do something. And it's been really unique hearing the conversations that you've had during the week and how you've shared and different things that God has done. And so we talked about, are we, are we really trusting God with everything we have? And so the challenge at the end of service was to leave the shoes you're wearing on your feet, right? And amazingly, between the two services, about 70 of you did that. And so these shoes are gonna to go to people in need, and there's all sorts of different sizes of shoes here. And uh, what I loved is that it wasn't just about collecting shoes, about emptying your closets out, which, by the way, please don't empty your closets out of shoes. Um, these, this is great. Is that, are we willing to take what we wore to church and put them here, and then also walk out without them? And it's this challenge that has continued and many people have processed. I heard a story Sunday night, someone texted me, uh, Carl actually texted me from first service, and, he said, hey, um, you know, we, we gave shoes, and then to, tonight after our soccer match, his daughter Kate, which there's a picture of her here, after her soccer match on Sunday night, someone walked up to her and gave her two full bags of shoes that didn't fit her anymore and wanted Kate to have them. And Kate essentially said this. She said, how amazing is it that we gave up our shoes on Sunday, and someone on my team just gave me a bunch of shoes that don't fit? is here is a student connecting this generosity that is all God's. This is not a prosperity teaching of you give to get. That's not it at all. But rather this generosity and that God blessed her back with this in such a way because it's all God's anyways. It's like God is saying to her, hey, hey, I have you. You gave your shoes, but I have you. I have you. And maybe that's all you need to hear today is that God's saying, I have you. 
It's all God's anyways. I have you. Got you. I've got you. Whatever that need is, whatever that concern is, got you. And so what a blessing that was. So today we're moving into our second elephant, and I'm already frustrated because um, there's no way I can even like scratch the surface on this topic. And in first service, I went long. This service, I'll try not to keep you too long, but I can't promise um, what that'll be. And we're still scratching the surface of this, and it's frustrating because there's so much more I want to say, so much I've had to cut out of um, preparation and even uh, in first service. And so this is where the ongoing conversation has to be with you, with your groups, in community, whatever it may be. And so, uh, again, I uh, encourage you to do that. But as we begin, I'm going to invite you to participate. Now, there's Sundays where I ask you to raise your hand or not raise your hand, and some of you just are like, I'm not doing anything. Today, uh, you, get, you get to participate whether you want to or not. Um, I'm going to ask you a preference. Do you prefer this or this? And I'm going to ask you, if you prefer this one thing, to stand up. Or if you prefer the other thing, to sit. Now, some of you are starting to sweat, going like, what is he going to ask us? It's all right. Not, not overtly con con controversial. Well, actually, maybe one or two. I did hear a com couple comments coming out of the first one. So here we go. This is how we're going to do it. If you prefer hot weather, stand up. If you prefer the cold weather, stay seated. All right. So hot weather, stand up. Cold weather, stay seated. All right. Thank you for participating. All right. We're going to reset. If you prefer an iPhone, stand up. If you are an whoa, that was enthusiastic over there. If you prefer Android, stay seated. <laughs> iPhone up, Android seated. All right, similar to the phone. If you prefer to call people, stand up. If you prefer to text people, stay seated. If you prefer to call people, stand up. If you prefer to text, stay seated. All right, all right, reset. The direction, this is, this is important, the direction of the toilet paper on the roll. Over the top, stand up. The wrong way, underneath, stay seated. <laughs> all right, the last one. If you are an extrovert, stand up. If you are an introvert, stay seated. Introverts, you're welcome. All right. All right, go ahead and have a seat. Now, something interesting happened in this service, and it happened in last service in the exact same way. As I asked you to make decisions about your preferences, you, you had to make a decision, right? I, I, I essentially forced you into groups. But what happened is, uh, even more so in the first service, the first one, people stood up and just looked forward. And you did it to a degree in this service as well. You just looked at me, like, I'm hot weather, I'm standing, you know, in cold weather, I'm sitting. By the second question of iPhone or Android, which there was a lot of enthusiasm for iPhone over here, <laughs> you started looking around the room. You started noticing, hey, who uses iPhones like I do? Or who uses an Android like I do? Who has their toilet paper go in this direction? And you started to have conversation. So you noticed who was with you, but you also noticed people who were doing the opposite thing of you. And maybe that was someone in your household, or maybe that was someone you're sitting near or across the room. And maybe what has happened is even in these silly, smaller topics, you have a new connection with someone. You're like, that's right, they like to text. I'm gonna text them later. I'm not calling them. But at the same time, you've noticed differences. People walked out of first service being like, man, we're, we're different in all those categories, this person that they were with. And so what can easily happen is we all of a sudden start to form what we call, our sociologists call, in-groups. These are people like me. Same interests, same choices. This is my in-group. And then there's a whole other group of people that they're the out-group, sociologists call them. They've chosen something different than I like or I prefer. And so what we do is we naturally move towards our in-group. This is a very just human reality, is we look for people who are like us, and then we join up with them. This happens on the playgrounds and hallways of schools. 
is the athletes hang out together, the band kids hang out together, the orchestra kids hang out together, the very academically minded hang out together. I'm sure there's some crossover, but, but the band kids, they just get me. Or maybe it's a particular team you cheer for, college team, a pro team, or in college uh, fraternity or sorority that you're a part of, a political party, an income level, and the lifestyle that comes with it, or even a church. This is my in-group, the others are my out-group. These are people like me, these are people not like me. Some of the in-groups we choose, others just occur. So for example, with the in-groups, like moms, how many, how many moms are in the room here? Your mom. All right, yep. So I'm not in your in-group. Shocking, right? I'm not in your in-group. I'm a dad. So I'm, I'm outside of that. Or, you know, one that likes to divide our country at this time, how many Michigan fans are there in the room? Yep. And then, you know, then there's the Michigan State and Ohio State and everyone else, right? Is, uh, oh, wait, did I just say that out loud? I showed my bias there. <laughs> But there's people in our in-group, you get this, this in-group and out-group. There's people in our in-group that we interact with. You go to a social gathering, you go to those people because there's a commonality, there's a connection point. You have similar behaviors or attitudes. You're comfortable around people who are like you. You may cooperate or have goodwill or sense a sense of like connection with people who are like you. And you may even give preferential treatment to the people that are like you. On the flip side, the out group, often you don't know people in out groups around you as well. And so what do you do? You, you, you fill in the gaps. You make assumptions about people in that group. Like I make assumptions about Ohio State fans, right? Is that there's a lot of assumptions. I just fill in the gap. I don't really wanna to get to know you, Matt Russell. So it's, uh, <laughs> but we make assumptions and the opposite is true the other way. We may avoid or have indifference or even antagonism towards someone that's in an out group, maybe a negative attitude. And the way you treat your out group can be very mild, like I just avoid them, or it can be very dehumanizing. Someone wrote about this and said that this dehumanizing factor of out groups, what's led to the lynching trees in America, the smokestacks of Auschwitz, programs of Lebanon, the genocides of Rwanda, the gulags of the USSR, and these amount to tens of millions of lives lost because that person or those people were not in my in-group. As human beings, we naturally divide ourselves out. There's just something in us, and it's called sin, that we divide ourselves from others. It's a world of us against them, sometimes consciously, other times subconsciously or unconsciously we just respond a certain way. As followers of Jesus, when we look at one group of people and we gather others and we're like, no, they're just, they're so wrong. And not only are they wrong, they're evil and they're demonic and, and they just can't be trusted and they're all these things. And then on this group, looking across in this division of you're wrong, you're demonic, you're evil, you're, and there's just this division that we exist in. And and for some reason, culture in the church has jumped right in with it of this demonizing of the out group, the group that you're not in. And as followers of Jesus, we need to recognize that this division caused by the enemy, as we're gonna see here in just a few moments, is anti-life, anti-gospel, and anti-Jesus. So today, as we talk about divisions around us, specifically as we look at racism, a problem we can't ignore, we can't run from, we can't just hope it will go away of like, Chris, if you just wouldn't talk about this, if people wouldn't talk about it, it'd just be fine. There's division around us, and it's not what Jesus gave his life for. Now, the dictionary defines racism as a belief that race or ethnicity is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities, and that racial and ethnic differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race or ethnicity. So essentially what this is saying is that one race or ethnicity says I'm better than you. I'm better than you. And I wanna be super clear as I stand here today to say that racism is sin. It's rooted in the heart 
It's evil and it's a spiritual issue. It's found in our hearts and then in our manifestation of systems of discrimination, of structures of discrimination. And it's a sin. There's a number of passages that speak to this in scripture, in scripture and I wish I could just sit here and unpack this again and again and again. But James 2, I just want to show an example of this. James 2, verse 8 and 9. If you are really keeping the royal law found in Scripture, the royal law that Zoe read to us earlier, about love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing it right. But if you show favoritism, which this word in the Greek can be translated into prejudice, if you show favoritism or prejudice, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Sin. So once again, I want you to think about your in-groups, your out-groups, and the biblical mandate to love our neighbor. This is a great scene in Joshua chapter 5 where Joshua is heading to Jericho. The enemy is there. They're ready to go to battle, and he comes across someone holding a sword. I don't know what you do or what you do when you come in contact with someone holding a sword in front of you. But Joshua asks this question. He says, he says are you for us? Are you for our enemies? Are you for us or are you for our enemies? Joshua is saying, are you with the Israelites, our in-group? Or are you the enemies, the out-group? I love the, the man with the sword. He answers this way, neither. Like, nope. There's a different way. There's a different way. And I want to tell you this morning is that what Jesus came and what Jesus presented, specifically and especially within the Sermon on the Mount, is a radical third way. It's not this group or this group. It's not this way or this way. It's a third way, like this man with the sword said. I'm not with you and I'm not with them. It's neither. And this is what he continues by saying. He says, uh, uh, but as a commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Love this. Is that Joshua immediately saw that it was the Lord's way. It wasn't this way or this way. It was the Lord's way. It was this third way. And what he said, he said, the ground you're standing on is holy. Why? Because God's presence was there. And as followers of Jesus Christ, as those part of the church, those filled by the Spirit of God, the mark of God, when we go filled by the Spirit of God, God's presence is with us. Therefore, the ground we stand on is holy because God is there and active. And so therefore, it must be different than just demonizing other people and launching attacks back and forth as followers of Jesus. And division is nothing new we see it throughout the history of Scripture, throughout the history of time. It's something that we have with us, and it's something that's going to continue to carry forward. But as followers of Jesus, we have to be different. We have to have a perspective like God does. Consider this third way in Ephesians chapter 6. Paul said this, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against human beings. Not against that person in whatever group, those people in whatever group, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Not against human beings, against the enemy. You're not fighting against each other. It's the enemy causing division. The enemy's tool is division in your home, in your school, in your workplace, in your city, in our country, in the world. That is the tool of the enemy. If he can divide what has been brought together, there's a win. But what do we focus on? It's so tempting to jump in right here or jump in right here with everything because our culture pushes us towards it and the church is just as guilty. What do we do? What's the commonality? Well, the commonality is that every person is made in the image of God. Every single person. So a couple thoughts with this. Is one, there is not an inferior or superior race or ethnicity. 
In Deuteronomy, we see that God loves and cares for all people regardless of their ethnicity, nationality, and social status. In Acts 10, Scripture says that God does not show favoritism, or like we saw earlier, prejudice, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Paul in 1 Corinthians said we were all baptized by one spirit to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles. Now, if I had like another hour to go into, we would be looking at the Jew-Gentile division. We're gonna briefly touch onto it today. But Paul, when you read the letters that Paul wrote to the churches, pay attention to the division that was there because of ethnicity. It is all over that. In Paul, in Ephesus, he says, Jesus came to remove the hostility and introduce harmony. And ultimately, when Jesus prayed, when he taught us to pray, he taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. So what's being done in heaven and what will be done in heaven is to be brought here by us. That's what we're to pray and that's what we're to live out. So let's give a snapshot from Revelation chapter seven of what heaven looks like. Revelation chapter seven says this, after I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the lamb. Every nation, tribe, people, and language. Pastor and author Tim Keller, he commented on this passage and he said this, he said, our resurrected bodies will keep their ethnicity. Final redemption then does not erase racial and cultural differences. Different cultures have their own particular glories and splendors analogous to the different gifts of the body of Christ. That's why Jesus in John 17, he prayed for the church that we would be unified, that we would be focused on Jesus focused on Jesus, that Jesus came to bring peace where there's strife, to bring kindness where there's animosity. And Jesus told a very famous story in Luke 10. I encourage you to flip over to Luke 10. What Zoe read for us earlier. An expert of the law comes and scripture says that he came to test Jesus, this lawyer who knew the law, he knew what was going on. He came to test Jesus and he said, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what do you see written in the law? What do you see written in scripture? And the expert of the law says, hey, love God with my heart, my soul, my strength, my body, and love my neighbor. And Jesus is like, that's exactly it. That's it, love God and love your neighbor. Now, what happens here is the expert in the law knows that there's another question. Jesus knows that there's another question too. And in verse 29, it says this. It says, but he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Justify meaning showing himself righteous. Because what he wanted Jesus to say, he wanted Jesus to say, you and your Israelites, those who are just like you in your in-group, that's your neighbor. That's what the expert expected him to say. That's where Jesus was leading him along. And then the man would be like, yeah, I fully love them. Yeah, I I can love my family and and those like me, those in my in-group. Yeah, I can definitely love them. I did it. I'm good. But Jesus was taking him deeper into this. This is why Jesus tells his stories to unearth different things going on within us that we just try to suppress or try to justify. See, the expert in the law would have known this passage from Leviticus 19 which directed the Israelites that their neighbors are fellow Israelites. In Leviticus 19, do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor, frankly, so that you do not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So what the the Torah is saying, the Leviticus, the book of Leviticus is, your neighbor is people just like you. So the experts come into Jesus saying, hey, this is what it is. And there was also other teaching that was going on at this time. For example, there were rabbis that were saying heretics, informers, and renegades should be pushed into the ditch and not pulled out. So, so that'd be like me standing up here today being like, hey, anyone not like you, you just, you know, on the way home, just run them off the road, all right? Just run them off the road. That's terrible, right? 
But there's this teaching. And then there was a midrash, which is an ancient oral interpretation of, of the scriptures that said this. So again, things that were being taught. The Gentiles, so the non-Jews and non-Israelites, we are not to contrive their death, but if they be in any danger of death, we're not bound to deliver them. If any of them fall into the sea, you shall not need to take them out, for it is said, thou shalt not rise up against the blood of thy neighbor. But such a one is not thy neighbor. So essentially, if you see someone along the road, if you see someone in the sea, as long as you didn't cause their death, you're good. Just keep going. This is being taught. This is where the expert of the law is coming from. Verse 30, Jesus said, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Two key details that Jesus added in here is that they took his clothes so no one could tell who he was connected with. Your dress would determine who your people were, who your ethnicity, who your, who your group was, your family, your everything. And then they beat him and went away, leaving him half dead, meaning he was unconscious. So language, dialect, anything could not be heard. This was simply a person in need. Jesus was saying, what will you do with a human being? Someone made in the image of God. Verse 31, a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by the other side. So he saw the man, and he's like, I can't even get close, and he went around. And the reason being is that he would be defiled if he got within a certain distance if the man was dead. And the priest was going to serve in his temple duties, and so to be defiled, he would have to be purified, which would take a number of days, meaning that he couldn't serve at the temple, which would mean that he wouldn't be paid, which means that he and his family would suffer. Two, he was also told by teachings in the book of Sirach, a wisdom writing outside of scripture, but held as a wisdom writing, was that he wasn't to help anyone that was considered to be a sinner or evil. And so when he got to temple, he would have told the story. And he was stuck within a system that forced him to tell this story. And those at the temple, other priests would be like, you know what, good job. You didn't defile yourself, you didn't sin, and, and you know what, you weren't supposed to help him anyways because he's, he's a sinner. He's from another group. But he would have been affirmed, and he's stuck in a system that won't allow him to step out. The next person that Jesus tells goes by is a Levite. And it says a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. So this individual, the Levite, who would have served under the priest, came and looked that close. So he was defiled. He couldn't serve. But it didn't matter in that case. But he came and he looked and he said, like, I don't really know. And he decided to go to the other side. Now, why didn't he help? Because the priest had a system that was broken and a blind spot in his own heart. This one, the Levite walked around because scholars believe that Individuals traveling this road, the 17-mile journey, would have known who was ahead of them. Scholars believe that the Levite would have known that the priest had gone by, why well, Jesus tells it this way, and that the Levite wouldn't want to have shown up his superior. The superior didn't do it, so I shouldn't do it. So what do we learn from this? Is what have we been taught from parents or grandparents or neighbors or teachers about the way we view other people? We may go, hmm, but I can't help. Not my responsibility, not my duty, not my, my group. What happens if we step out and we have conversations that we look at the world through different lens? Jesus continues in verse 33, but a Samaritan as he traveled came to where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. Pity means compassion. Compassion like Jesus had. This is an intentional word that Jesus used, this pity, this compassion, that he saw and there was something that changed within him. It wasn't just a duty. It wasn't anything. It was a human being there. Instead, he went to him and he bandages, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. 
And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you have. There's costly love. Not only did he notice, but there was a giving of himself for someone that was in need. Now, we're so far outside of Jesus' culture that we miss the shock of this story. We've heard over the years the way Samaritans are talked about and thought about. And I want to give you just two snapshots here. Again, in the, the book of Sarash, this book of wisdom, which is held in high esteem, these are some words. There are two nations that my soul detests. The third is not a nation at all, the inhabitants of Mount Seir, and the Philistines and the stupid people living at Sheshem. In light of what we're talking about here today, and Jesus telling a story about the Samaritan, the people that lived at Sheshem are Samaritans. Another historian wrote these words about how Samaritans were treated. The Samaritans were publicly cursed in the synagogues, and a petition was daily offered up in praying that God, that the, praying to God that the Samaritans might not be partakers in eternal life. So they're praying when they gather that the Samaritans would not have eternal life. Again, it, it, like if I came in here and just said, we need to pray that such and such does not have eternal life, I would hope every single one of you would stand up and leave, right? But here, the Samaritans are so hated, the, the Jews called them dogs and half-breeds and a herd, and the greatest insult was to call someone a Samaritan. And we may look and go like, I can't believe this. But we do it here today. We do it. We do the same thing. We have names and categories and assumptions, just like I started early on. Maybe not as patient. We're maybe not as giving. We're not as willing to help someone who's not in our quote-unquote in-group. Jesus tells a story of a Samaritan who has compassion, who takes pity to provoke something in his hearers then and his hearers now. Fill in where the Samaritan is with whatever person, people, whatever it may be that is an outgroup in your world. When we're a neighbor, we cannot, when we're followers of Jesus, we cannot be like the priest or Levite. Their number one concern was what will happen to me? Can't get near him because I can't serve at the temple. My family will be hurt. It's, it's just the system I'm in. Or the Levite of like, well, I can't, uh, the expectation of others, and I don't, I, don't, I don't know what they'll think of me. The question as followers of Jesus, the question as the church is, is what is going to happen to this person? That's the Jesus compassion. That's the Jesus heart. Verse 36, when these, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So to be a neighbor is to be merciful and compassionate. And ultimately, this is about reconciliation. Reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes these words. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. We just sit on this one line. Because of the gospel, because of the work Jesus did on the cross, because of him reconciling through Jesus us to him, we no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. There's a new me. If I'm following Jesus, there's a new me. These systems, these, these beliefs, these practices that are, are anti-Christ, are, are anti-life, are anti-gospel, they're gone. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He reconciled himself, or us to himself, so we could be right. And he gave us that same ministry of reconciliation. Yes, to proclaim Jesus, because with Jesus, that's where any reconciliation with humans begins and ends. It's the cross that destroyed anything that divides us. It's the cross that draws people to God and towards each other. See, peace with God should overflow with peace with others. 
And maybe if there's not peace with others, we look at what is the lack of peace with God? What is standing in the way? Reconciliation. God and to others. I want to wrap up with a story that happened in 1996. An hour down the road in Ann Arbor, the white supremacist group, the Ku Klux Klan, gathered. At the same time, a large crowd of protesters gathered in a different spot. The police were there. And as the groups were gathered, someone in the crowd noticed a white man wearing a Confederate flag T-shirt and had an SS tattoo on his arm. They shouted, there's a Klansman in the crowd. And so it created panic for everyone. This man started running. The crowd followed. And eventually the crowd caught up. And the man fell. Someone in the crowd cried out, kill the Nazi. They began to beat him. There was someone in the crowd that day named Keisha Thomas. This is her right there. Keisha Thomas was 18 years old, a senior in high school. She was there with a the crowd protesting. And what Keisha did is Keisha dove on top of the man to protect him. She absorbed the blows from the crowd, most likely saving this man's life, pushing people back, laying on top of him. Later on, Keisha was interviewed why she saved the life of someone who most likely would not have saved hers. She said it was both her belief in God and the faith that motivated her. But she also said, I wish, or I knew what it was like to be hurt. The many times that happened, I wish someone would have stood up for me. I wish someone would have stood up for me. The gospel is a reconciling message. It's a message of hope. It's a message of change. It's not just a, I got my ticket and I'm getting out of here and going to heaven someday. It is a thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven message. It is a message like we see in Revelation 7 with the nations, the languages, the people worshiping together. So what does it look like to bring heaven to earth here? I think it looks a lot like Keisha Thomas. I think it looks a lot like the Good Samaritan. I think it looks a lot like Jesus. They all saw a neighbor in need, and they were faithful to the gospel. What I want to do as we close here is I want to pause for a moment, a few moments. We all come from different backgrounds, Beliefs, different things. We all have views of the world and people around us. Some very Jesus-y, some very sinful. So what I'm gonna ask us to do is, in these few moments of silence, is that you would confess anything the Spirit may be just prompting, tapping on your heart. And maybe at this time, too, is that if there's something that was said that you don't like, that you struggle with, that you stand against, you ask that question of why? Spirit of God, what is it? Why? Why am I struggling with this? What is this? Would you take a few moments just to pray, to speak, to listen, to confess, whatever it may be, and then I'll lead us in prayer. Father God, 
Lord, we thank you for Jesus, who at the cross reconciled all of humanity, every single person made in your image, to you, giving us the opportunity to say yes to follow you. And Lord, maybe here today, in person or online, there's someone who has never made a commitment to you. But this is the starting point for this entire conversation. That today, they would say yes to following you. That in their heart, in their mind, God, you knowing it, would tell you that they're a sinner. They've sinned, they've tried to do it on their own. that they confess their sin to you as wrong, that because of that sin they've fallen short of the glory of God, and that today they put their faith in you, Jesus, who took all their sin right upon yourself on the cross, and that today not only that they would confess sin, they would seek to follow after you as Lord. And Lord, for all of us who have professed Jesus as our, our Savior, Lord, we at this moment consider your Lordship. God, individually, Lord, you've heard our confessions of, of how we've not made you Lord, how we've disregarded others in whatever way that is, that we've showed favoritism, prejudice, bias, God, both consciously and subconsciously. Lord, we confess that to you. Lord, and receive your forgiveness. Lord, as a, a church here in this corner in Marshall, as the church of Jesus Christ across the world, do we confess our sin out of those exact same things? Lord, and receive your forgiveness. Father, I thank you that you are a reconciling God. Lord, that you're one that causes us to see humans around us. God, I pray that you would give us the compassionate eyes to see the need of others around us. God, that we would respond in faith, that we would respond in this third way, when tempted, follow the world. Lord Jesus, I pray just for that compassionate heart that was witnessed and demonstrated by Keisha, by the Good Samaritan, and ultimately Jesus. So Lord, thank you that you love us, that you care about us. God, I pray that you would do a work in me and, and those around us. Lord, as we go from this place that we would continue to wrestle with these passages of scripture, we would wrestle with some of the thoughts here today. God, I pray that you'd use this congregation, that these households represented here, God is light, God is hope, Lord, really as a, God, a difference maker. The Lord, we love you. We're so, so grateful that we could be together. We pray this in Jesus' strong, powerful, and wonderful name. Amen. So as you go from this place, continuation. Conversations with compassion and conviction and continuation. That you would do that in your groups and in your communities. Um, and even Tuesday, if you want to join and talk about a number of different things we can talk about on Tuesday, the union at 615. So I um, just so wanna pray blessing, speak blessing over each and every one of you. Uh, after service here, I believe Randy and Stella are gonna be up front for prayer, and then there should be a Stephen minister too back at the cafe. Um, if we can provide any sort of care and prayer, we'll be there. Make sure you say thank you to the kids ministry leaders as I uh, kept you a little bit longer today. Uh, God bless you, and have a wonderful week. We'll see you next week. Thank you.